Okay, why don't we get started? So, this is the last lecture, and finally I'm going to arrive at uh, Loops, which is, of course, kind of the frontier, uh, for at least for uh, LHC calculations, and also investigating things like supergravity and so on. <coughs> and uh, I probably should have done this earlier, but uh, this is, a, if you want to look up a reference that covers a lot of what I've talked about already, um, uh, it's in uh, this archive article. The BCJ stuff is not in there, but you can read about it here. And then there are plenty of follow-up papers to that. And today, hopefully, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the mathematical functions you get when you do loop amplitudes. And there's a nice review of that by Claude Dürer. So what I really want to do today is uh, to talk about unitarity. Sometimes uh, it will be generalized unitarity. So that, that allows us to sow trees into loops. So we'll look at a simple example of, that, of doing that. And then uh, <coughs> talk about the uh, kinds of mathematical functions you get in loop calculations with an example of polylogs. That doesn't exhaust everything, but it's a good, it has plenty of its own intricacies. And if there's time, I'll uh, say a little bit about uh, applying some of these to uh, planar n equals four super Young Mills. So that's the plan for today. So <coughs> the uh, scattering matrix S is unitary. It comes from unitary time evolution with our Hermitian Hamiltonian. So it's something like e to the i h t. And uh, so we can write down the fundamental relation that it must obey, which is that S dagger S is 1. Now usually when you calculate an amplitude or, or the entire set of amplitudes, you uh, tend to write it as something like 1 plus I A. So this 1 here in the S matrix is sort of the forward part of the S matrix where the final state is the same as the initial state. So this is forward. Well, there can be a piece of forward over here too, but this is kind of called the non-forward part, and that's usually what you talk about. <coughs> so if we just take this uh, expression for the amplitude A and plug it in here, we'll get uh, 1 minus uh, I times A dagger 1 plus uh, I times A. And if we then uh, collect terms, you see we have an A minus an A dagger with an I in front of it. And that's uh, something like uh, minus uh, two times the imaginary part of A. So let's move that to the other side. And we get two uh, MA is uh, A dagger A. And this is often called the uh, discontinuity in A, twice the imaginary part. Generally, there will be, for example, in the two goes to two reaction, if you had masses, um, there would be a cut in the S plane of 4M squared. And the, the difference going from this side of the cut to this side of the cut is twice the imaginary part of, of the amplitude evaluated on one side of the cut. So that's that factor of two. So going from here to here, that's referred to as the discontinuity. And it's twice the imaginary part. The imaginary part flips sign as you go across the cut. OK, so <coughs> now let's take this equation and let's just expand it out perturbatively. So first of all, for the let's talk about four-point amplitudes in a gauge theory, 
where the fundamental coupling G is a, the three-point coupling. So then the uh, structure of the amplitude is that the four-point function at tree level, so this zero is the tree level term, has two powers of G in it. The one loop amplitude has uh, uh, four powers of G. Oh, and while we're at it, let's expand out the uh, five point amplitude. That starts at G cubed, right? If you have uh, two goes to three, three couplings. So now we're going to plug this in to the right hand side of this equation and uh, we're going to look for the discontinuity of the um, tree amplitude. But on the right hand side, so this is something that's of order g squared, but on the right hand side we have to take products of things that all start at least at g squared, so we're not going to see anything because the right hand side is uh, order g to the fourth. On the other hand, once we go to the uh, discontinuity of the one loop amplitude by picking off the terms of order g to the fourth on this side, we get just a four zero dagger a four zero. So in other words, the right hand side looks like this. So this re <coughs> looks a lot like what we were doing in tree amplitudes, right? In the uh, um, BCFW recursion relations, we are factorizing them and putting intermediate particles on shell. But the topology of trees is such that you can basically only force one thing to go on shell. Well, that's not quite true. You could, you could impose additional restrictions, but the, um, the simplest uh, ones are just with one particle on shell. But for a loop amplitude, we can put two particles on shell. And I should emphasize that all of this analysis here, where we, uh, this scattering matrix is a unitary matrix where we think of this as real scattering. So all these equations hold for where all the momenta are real everywhere, including the cut momenta. So this is called uh, ordinary unitarity because we're going to generalize it in a, in a minute. Okay, but first of all, this is sort of the fundamental relation for the four-point amplitude. So we might say that the discontinuity, the discontinuity of a one-loop blob in a given channel is found by inserting all intermediate states in here which at one loop requires, or can only, you can only accommodate two particles in the cut, because this is just a four-point amplitude times another four-point amplitude. You have two on the outside here, two on the outside here, two in the middle, and you're supposed to sum over all states, which means integrating over all allowed intermediate momenta. Any questions about that? If these were forward, that is if this state were this state, then this would be uh, related to the optical theorem. Then this would be the imaginary part of the forward amplitude, and this would be the total cross-section um, be uh, because it would be the square of an amplitude with the same state here as here. So, so this is a more general than the optical theorem. It contains it as a, sp uh, as a special case.
Now let's go one loop higher. I might need a little more room, so let's go over here. Yeah, so there's there's a uh, sum over particle type there's also well inside the sum over particle type there will be a sum over helicities and then there's also an integral over the Lorentz invariant phase space crossing this cut over all the momenta in the two-body case, it's very simple in the sense that you can go to some center of mass frame and you have two particles coming out and the sort of center of mass energy is fixed. So you kind of know the particle's momentum or velocity and you just have to integrate them over an angular sphere that they can uh, be on. So a two, you're doing an integral over a two-sphere to really recover this full discontinuity. <coughs> okay, so... Any other questions? So let's just repeat the same analysis at um, two loops where we're looking for all the terms that are order uh, g to the sixth. And uh, we have A4 zero dagger A4 one where we take g squared from here, g to the fourth from here, plus A4 one dagger A4 zero plus we can also take the five-point guy now so this was g to the fourth g squared and we can have g cubed g cubed we need it to do it at tree level so we can draw little graphs for this too this would be tree level on this side and uh, one loop on this side so this hole in the blob means it's at one loop. But of course you can slide the loop over to this side too and that corresponds to this term. And then finally this term here is um, a three particle cut. So you have two legs on the outside, on either side, but you have three, uh, three body intermediate phase space to integrate over, which is more complicated than the, the two body case. Okay, so we have these uh, three types of terms. Two part at two loops, you can do a two particle cut, but you need a loop amplitude on each side, or you can do a three particle cut with trees on both sides. Now, <coughs> there's two, uh, uh, ideas that you can use to try to make uh, perturbative calculations more efficient which involve using these equations but then what you want to do is uh, match these uh, relations to a set of uh, we, d we don't really want to perform all of these integrals uh, to get the discontinuity. We want to write the amplitude in a particular way involving a certain set of integrals. And then we want to take the discontinuities of that uh, set. Um, anyway, this will be more clear when we work through an example of uh, local integrands. So that, that will let us determine the, the integrands or really the, uh, basically the full amplitudes. Now, you might think it would be hard to get the full amplitudes because this is only the cut part. Maybe there's some part of the amplitude that doesn't have any cuts. To get the full amplitudes, there are 
various tricks. One, one example that works is to do the, the cuts uh, in, um, in dim reg in d equals 4 minus 2 epsilon dimensions. You often have to do this sort of anyway to regulate it, but if you do it seriously in 4, dimension, four minus 2 epsilon dimensions, it turns, you, turns out you can get back the full amplitudes. Anyway, that's one idea, is to try to match these relations to the perturbative structure of amplitudes. And the second thing is to go beyond this. Once you're doing the matching, and you're not really doing an integral over the real momentum phase space, uh, you don't need to, the momenta to be real anymore. You can allow the cut momenta to be complex. We saw how useful that was in tree amplitudes to allow the cut momenta to be complex. And that's true here too. So a local integrand is an integrand that looks like a Feynman diagram with some numerators on top. And so that all the stuff in the bottom is, looks like a Feynman propagator, one over p squared. The point is that sometimes you get representations of the integrands that aren't local. For example, suppose we took that six-point NMHV amplitude we had yesterday that had spurious poles, and suppose we kind of plugged it in to one of these things at loop level. Those spurious poles would look very weird in terms of the loop moment. Some of the variables would be loop momenta, and then those spurious poles look very weird they don't look like they have the right causality properties. It all cancels out because they're not really there, but it doesn't look like something you know how to integrate very easily. So that's a non-local form. And the point is that you know there should be a local form. So you want to get information out of taking the cuts and combine it with your knowledge that there should be a local form. So the cuts are... are uh, when you take a normal cut, you imagine a specific channel that you're in, but you're matching it to an expression in terms of a local integral which is agnostic as to which channel you're in. So you can extrapolate the information about the coefficients in front of certain integrals. You can extract it thinking maybe you're in one channel, but it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, the coefficient in front of the integral this is what we're going to get, and it's going to be a rational function. It doesn't really care about the cuts. You find it by matching the cuts of the integral that it's multiplying to this sort of uh, expression, and then you can extrapolate it to other kinematics because you know how to analytically continue the loop integral that it's multiplying. This will become clearer after we do one example, which is the only one we'll do, but the point is that when you don't need to restrict to real momenta, you don't have to limit yourself at one loop to just two particle cuts. So let's uh, look at Suppose we're doing a calculation of some loop amplitude with a lot of external legs like this. Ordinary unitarity would say that we can take a, a discontinuity in some channel and it will be a product of two trees. That's what we just saw, uh, connected by these two legs. But now let's remember what we were doing yesterday with the BCFW recursion relations and let's say I want to move around in this loop momentum space and I want thinking of these as the old legs n and 1 and if I move around in this loop momentum space I can find some region maybe with complex momenta generically with complex momenta where this thing factorizes again into 
into two blobs. And then maybe I go and move around a little more in the, inside that loop momentum space in a subspace, and I manage to factorize this. So now I have not just two cuts, but uh, you can have two cuts, three cuts, and four cuts. What about five cuts? Well, you can't do that generically if you're in if the cut momenta are in d equals four. Why not? Because every time you put a cut here, it imposes a condition. So let's call this guy L1, L2, L3, L4. And let's just say everything's massless. So the conditions of these cuts are that these particles are on their mass shell and uh, they're massless. That just means the relation is uh, this. So how many equations is that? It's four equations because I've imposed four conditions. And how many unknowns do I have? Well, I have uh, L1 mu, and mu is, uh, runs over the four components of space-time, so I have four unknowns. I should say that this L2 is not different from L1 because I'm holding the external momenta fixed. Suppose that the momenta going off here were K1. In that case, L2 is actually L1, the free variable, minus a fixed offset, K1. And if then I have K2 over here, then uh, L3 is uh, L1 minus K1 minus K2, and, and so on. So, so the only unknown variables are the four components of L1. Okay? I really only have four components of the loop momenta. So generically, if I have more than four equations, I can't solve them. That's right. There's no solution, at least for generic momenta. If the external momenta happen to lie in some uh, special configuration, then maybe you can solve them. But if the external momenta are generic, you can't solve those five equations. There has to be certain dependencies in order for you to find a solution. So gener generally speaking, you don't need to compute five particle cuts, quintuple cuts, if if uh, your cut momenta are in four dimensions. But I already mentioned that sometimes you want to take the cut momenta to, uh, well, we'll get a little extra dimensional because that's the trendy thing to do today, right? So we, we want to use dimensional regularization and we want to take an extra component of the loop momentum seriously. And if there's only one extra component of the loop, if, there's, if you're at one loop, then you might as well you can always rotate. You're supposed to do it in d equals 4 minus 2 epsilon, where we think of this as being actually positive. But it's equivalent at one loop to just doing it in d equals 5. So at one loop, if you're trying to do these cuts fully d-dimensionally, then you do need to consider these uh, pentagons or, or quintuple cuts, but nothing above that. Well, this is really supposed to be a cut of a loop diagram. You loop then everything that's, every blob in here is a tree. I'm at one loop, and once I start to cut it, then things reduce to tree topologies. The additional cuts just take the trees and reduce them to simpler trees. But even the first two particle cut, well, there are also some one particle cuts. We're not going to get into that detail right here. So anyway, we, we have these uh, two particle cuts, three particle cuts, and quadruple cuts to consider. And in addition, sometimes you need these uh, d-dimensional cuts. You really only need them 
sort of at the last step to fix what we call the rational part. So the idea is to take these different kinds of cuts and then to match it to a, uh, another expression. So we're going to match it to a big formula, which um, looks sort of like this. So I should explain this formula. These d i c i b i and r n are all uh, rational functions in the kinematics. So they don't uh, have any cuts. When you take a cut, it doesn't see these rational functions. It goes inside and it cuts these things. These things are loop integrals, but they're very specific loop integrals. It's a scalar integral. That's what this one means. It just means that you um, integrate d4l1, ignoring overall factors, the product of these four propagators. L1, L2, L3, L4. So this is called a scalar box integral. And these have all been done a long time ago. You can look them up. So you know what these functions are. So when you want to go compute a given amplitude, your task is to figure out what these coefficients are in front. Now, normally, when you uh, think about doing the Feynman diagrams for this process in gauge theory, you would have a lot of numerators in the Feynman diagrams, numerator algebra, depending on the loop momenta. But there's a way to reduce all of those integrals down by uh, some combination of uh, reduction methods called Passerino-Veltman, and for higher point integrals, there was an I some ideas due to Van Nerven <coughs> and Vermazarin. And we, we studied some aspects of the higher point integrals too. You don't see any pentagon integrals or uh, hexagon integrals or heptagon integrals in here. And the reason is that those integrals can be reduced algebraically down to boxes. And the original derivations maybe weren't so transparent, but the essential reason why they could be reduced down is what we were saying, that if all the external momenta and the loop momenta were in four dimensions, the loop integrand can't really have five independent singularities. There must be a way to partial fraction it out into terms that have it, each term having at most four singularities, and those terms are really box integrals. So there must be an identity relating pentagon integrals to box integrals. And those inter identities were found a long time ago, but they uh, have to be there because of the causal structure that you can't have five, satisfy five cuts um, at once, generically. 
So these are box integrals, triangle integrals, and bubble integrals. And maybe I should also explain what is happening on the outside here. N might be very large. What you need to do is you need to sum over all the ways of taking those N external legs and jamming them into four corners here. So it's the number of part, this sum here is a sum over um, partitions of N, of N things into four sets. Sorry, I'm not writing this very well. Anyway, you have to partition N and the N legs into four sets. Here you partition them into three sets, and here you just split them into two sets. And this is called the triangles, integral, obviously, and bubbles. And then this is uh, rational. This has uh, secretly, it might have some d dimensional integrals where if you expand near epsilon equal to zero in dim reg, they, they become rational. At higher orders in epsilon, they have cuts. And because they have cuts in higher orders in epsilon, you can determine them using unitarity too, even though they don't have cuts in four dimensions. So, any questions about this? It uses some tricks, Passerino Veltman, to reduce down tensor integrals without going through the full um, Passerino Veltman reduction. Let's just suppose we have a loop momentum like L1 in, inside our integral. And it's dotted into some external momenta. Suppose it's dotted into K1. Then we can rewrite this as uh, L1 minus K1 squared. Well, we need a minus 1 half. And we miss by L1 squared and K1 squared. But L1 minus K1 squared is, is L2 squared. So in this case, you can see that we can replace this polynomial loop momenta, this, this particular factor, by an L2 squared minus an L1 squared. And we can cancel off some of these denominator factors. And when you cancel a denominator factor, that's one of these graphs. It shrinks one of these legs to zero. And you would go from a box to a triangle. This is not a full derivation, just, just a sketch of the fact that when you have momenta in the numerator, you can reduce them down and eventually get to this decomposition. So that if you like, this is a Gedanken Feynman diagram calculation. We're not actually going to use Feynman diagrams, but we're using the perturbative structure if we had used Feynman diagrams. And then instead, we're going to take a shortcut to get these coefficients by calculating unitarity cuts. So I'm going to now give you an example. The one example is to calculate a particular quadruple cut. And that quadruple cut will lead us directly to one box coefficient. So we're going to put four of the particles on shell. Once we put four particles on shell, we already know that we will get no contributions from any of the uh, triangle terms, because there's only three things that can go on shell in this singularity of this triangle, or here, or rational. So the quad quadruple cut is nice because it doesn't get contaminated by mixtures of different integrals. Suppose we had done the two particle cut. Then we would get contributions from here, but there are many triangles that also have two particle cuts in them and also many boxes that have two particle cuts. So these bubbles are contaminated by triangles and boxes, and it's known how to remove the contamination, but it just takes a while to describe how to do it. So let's just do one quadruple cut. Uh, 
I'll redraw this with our specific momenta here. So let's suppose we're trying to calculate, uh, say, 5.1 loop gluon amplitude for the helicity configuration like this. And we're going to do uh, a particular uh, quadruple cut that sort of separates these in a particular way. So let's draw this diagram here. We have some gluons, one minus, two minus, three plus, four plus, five plus. Okay, now we have to decide where, what we're going to put for the intermediate helicities. And like if you look over here, you see this, is, this quadruple k cut is, has within it a uh, double cut which has two plus helicities on this side. Okay, so there's a four point amplitude with two plus helicities over here, a four gluon tree amplitude. It looks like a special case of it because I further split it into two three-point amplitudes, but it has to obey the, the rules for four gluon amplitudes. So what do these, where, what do we have to put over here to make that work? You remember which helicity configurations are allowed for the four gluon amplitude? Now remember that uh, the four gluon amplitude, A4 tree, with, with the all outgoing vanishes. And the only one that's non-zero is, uh, well, there's different color orderings, but you have to have two minuses and two pluses to get something non-zero. So I have to put a minus here and a minus here. And then according to the all outgoing conventions, when you cross the cut, you have to put a plus here and a plus here. Now let's do the same analysis Looking at this, they're up on top here. If you glue these two together, this makes another four point tree amplitude. So the same argument applies. And we have to put a minus here and a minus here so that this upper four point amplitude is satisfied, is happy to be non zero. And then we have to put pluses here and pluses here. So using those rules, we figured out what the helicity assignments are. So, by the way, another reason I'm doing the quadruple cut is because it's actually simpler than the triple cut or the two particle cut. And let's figure out why is it simpler? Well, remember, we have exactly the same uh, number of equations as unknowns. Here's the four loop momenta L1. Uh, sorry, I labeled these a little different this time. L1, L3, L4, L5. Just because L2 in a five point w might have been there and it's missing. So we have four equations in four unknowns. So we should have a discrete set of solutions. How many solutions do we have? Well, L1 squared equals zero, that's a quadratic equation, so it should have two solutions. You might think you get another factor of two from the next equation, but remember that uh, L1 squared minus L3 squared is um, um, L1 squared minus L1 minus K1 minus K, K2 squared, and that is, um, to uh, K2 
plus K2 dot L1 plus uh, or minus So this is linear. The L3 squared equation can be rewritten as L1 squared minus L3 squared, and it's linear. And all of these other ones are linear, where they expect there's really only one that's quadratic. Given that there's one quadratic equation and the rest are linear, there must be two solutions. And that would be true for a generic quadruple cut. But here we have very special quadru uh, quadruple cut because we have a bunch of three-point trees. And remember the three-point trees, there are two complex solutions, but the helicity configurations force you to choose one of them. And so, uh, so this two solutions is generic. But in this case, we only have one non-vanishing solution. So you could, the helicity analysis forced us into one helicity configuration and that one will only be supported on one of the two solutions. So what we do need to do now is there should be a unique formula for the loop momenta in terms of the external momenta or spinners. And the solution is going to be complex because we got three point stuff going on here. And so the um, question is, how should we solve for it? Let's just look at L4 here. So L4 is sandwiched, it, it participates in two three point um, formulas. And uh, this, this one over here looks like uh, so this thing maybe I should just write this out this is going to be a4 tree minus l1 plus 1 minus 2 minus l3 plus a3 tree minus l3 minus 3 plus L4 plus A3 tree minus L4 plus 4 plus L5 minus need the entire board here Okay, you can check that I got all the helicities uh, right compared to this figure. But in any case, this is uh, equal to, this is an MHV tree amplitude with two minuses, which are one and two. And that gives us a one, two to the fourth in the numerator, which we can cancel one of them against the denominator. And uh, then we get things involving L's, and I'm going to ignore all the minus signs. Those are just giving me factors of I's and minus signs that all work out in the end. Notice that this has two pluses and one minus, which tells us that we're supposed to use the square brackets. So I'm just writing down MHV and anti-MHV amplitudes one after the other. Whoops. Yeah. Yeah, we're not going to do the whole thing. 
<laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> I can see you getting uh, <laughs> running when that will run out of time. We're just going to do this one case, but but actually, uh, it turns out that all the other quadruple cuts are almost identical. Um, but uh, we'll just do this one, and then there's the triple and bubble, and uh, so on. Yeah. So anyway, um, main thing is that the structure of these three-point amplitudes gives us a clue as to what L4 must be. You see, in this uh, amplitude that has the 4 plus in it, we have angle brackets here. And so um, we know that in this kinematics, uh, 4 the square brackets must all vanish. In particular, uh, 4L4 must be 0. And so that means that uh, L4 alpha alpha dot should have a factor of lambda 4 tilde alpha dot. It should be proportional to, uh, what am I doing? Yeah, this is the loop momentum L4. This is the spinner associated with external momentum K4. So this thing should be proportional to the tilde spinner, the alpha dot guy, the guy that goes into the square bracket, because this square bracket has to vanish because this formula tells us the angle brackets do not vanish. Similarly, when we come over here, we see that the angle bracket of L4 with 3 should vanish. So this thing should also be proportional to, to lambda 3, not the, not the tilde, but the lambda 3, the right-handed spinner for 3 and the left-handed spinner for 4. So now we know what this loop momentum is up to a constant. and uh, we can determine the uh, constant. So we've sort of used the information here and here that these are on-shell three-point amplitudes, but we can go around the corner to here and use that information. So L1 squared is equal to zero, which is L4 minus uh, K4 minus K5 squared, which is S45 from here minus 2L dot K4 plus K5. But we already saw that L4 has to be have zero dot product with this. So when you uh, solve this equation, Um, plug in for L4 in terms of C and solve for C. And C is, turns out to be uh, 4, 5 over 3, 5. So now we know what this uh, loop momentum is. And all the other loop momenta are related by, by shifting it by external momenta. So now we have all the ingredients we need to evaluate this formula. So if you have nothing better to do this weekend, you can do that. <laughs> but let me just uh, write down what, what you get. So we get for, this is going to be the uh, coefficient. This quadruple cut picks out a particular loop integral, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, this scalar box integral. So we call that D, we might call it D1, 2, because 1 and 2 are, are lumped together there. And the final answer is uh, that we get, well, there's some overall factor of a half that, that you get, but um, you get uh, something that looks very familiar. You, 
you get an extra factor of S3, 4, S4, 5. So in fact, it's just um, something like I over 2, S3, 4, S4, 5. Maybe this has, I don't know, a uh, minus sign or something. So that um, this just becomes the tree amplitude. So this box coefficient turns out to be the tree amplitude multiplied by a quite simple uh, kinematic factor. So I didn't go through all that, and there are sometimes various shortcuts you can use in the evaluation having to do with how these other loop momenta differ by external momenta from L4, but uh, it's just an exercise in, in working with these spinner products. Any questions about that? In the end, it can only depend on the external momenta, of course, because the loop momenta are completely determined in terms of them. No, but they often look like pieces of tree amplitudes. So like when you do an NMHV loop amplitude, the typical thing you will get for a coefficient is one of the terms in the BCFW relation. So that's a typical thing for the boxes. When you go to the triangles, you will start to develop some spurious stuff downstairs. Well, the, a piece of the NMHV tree has spurious singularities in it. We already talked about that. But you get new kinds of spurious singularities in the triangle and bubble coefficients. And those spurious singularities, they cancel out, just like we saw in trees, except that it's even more complicated how, they, you know, how exactly they cancel. The cancellation involves what the loop integrals themselves are doing as well. So this coefficient d12 in the tree in the loop amplitude that we're interested in, it's not the only term, but it multiplies uh, an integral, which is let's call this i412, which is just this thing. And now I'm just going to write down what the formula for it is. It has infrared divergences. We did. We looked at triangle integrals before that had double poles and epsilon. Very similar massless propagators that are separated by massless legs, like in the triangle integral. And uh, you might remember that we had um, double poles, and then we had some piece of their divergence that depended on the kinematic variable S34 or, or the two adjacent legs. And so you won't be very surprised then to see that you get similar factors for S34, S45, and then there's one leftover one for S12. And then you get finite terms, and the finite terms involve uh, dialogues. So the dialogue is an integral of the logarithm. That appears here. And you'll notice that this factor here exactly cancels 
this factor here. And so when you multiply the two together, you find that the five point amplitude is just the tree amplitude multiplied by a transcendental function. If you expand this out in epsilon, it, every function you see is either logarithms or dilogarithms. And uh, that's a nice uh, characteristic that has to be, that is true in N equals four super Yang Mills theory. But wait, I said we were doing pure glue. What's going on here? All we did was we put in uh, pure glue on terms in the cuts. But in this case, it's equivalent to N equals four super Yang Mills in right here. Why is that? Well, of course I erased the uh, picture that would have shown it to you, but remember that this quadruple cut had within it a cut like this, which required us to make these two particles negative helicity. That negative helicity, if you're following a particle around the loop, is really a helicity flip because coming into this loop, into this cut, it actually has plus. So it went from plus to minus as it went around the loop. Suppose we have a massless quark and we try to do the same thing. So we have a massless quark of plus helicity here and by the time it gets around to here, it's supposed to be minus helicity. Um, well, I didn't quite explain this to you, but that's uh, forced on you by another e relation, which I didn't really explain. But it's not very hard to calculate these tree amplitudes. And uh, this case um, is zero. No, it's on shell because we've drawn a cut through it. Before you cut it, it's uh, off shell. But if you're evaluating the cut, you get to put it on shell here and you get to assign a holicity to it. And uh, well, what I really should have told you is that, that this amplitude is also zero. And this is really what forbids a contribution to this cut from a fermion in the loop. So this, this relation, which you can easily verify, says that there's no uh, fermion loop contribution. And furthermore, the same thing is true for scalars. The amplitude for, tree amplitude for scalars in any representation and two gluons also says there's no scalar in the loop. And N equals four super Yang Mills has in it a gluon, four fermions, gluinos, and, and six uh, scalars. But the point is that for this case, these guys don't contribute. And so we simultaneously calculate a term in the N equals four super Yang Mills amplitude and in the uh, uh, gluon amplitude. In fact, what you find out is that the N equals four super Yang Mills amplitude is only boxes. And furthermore, all the boxes have coefficients which are just permutations of this formula as you cycle around to pick up five different boxes where you merge together the two adjacent legs in five different ways. You just pick up the same formula and the prefactor is again the tree amplitude times whatever this thing becomes. So it, it ends up being the uh, A5 one loop N equals four is equal to A5 tree times 
this thing plus cyclic. So I didn't prove this to you, but uh, anyway, that's the answer. You take this thing in brackets, in braces, and just sum over the five cyclic permutations of it, and that's the answer. In the QCD case, um, there are boxes, and those in all the other channels are the same. I think, pretty sure, I think they're the same as um, in uh, as below. So as in n equals four. However, there are also um, triangles and uh, bubbles, which and rational, which have to be calculated separately. Anyway, all that can be done, and you can actually automate all this stuff. And there are various programs, you know, at least five different, maybe ten different programs by now that you can uh, that can calculate these one-loop amplitudes using this kind of method. So, does anybody have any questions about that? Okay. So now I wanted to turn to um, a little more discussion of the kinds of functions that enter amplitudes. And we're not going to go into the detail of, of really calculating anything for real anymore. But I want to talk about the kinds of functions that enter not just one loop amplitudes, where the most complicated thing that appears is actually a dialogue, but more general amplitudes where you have to introduce new types of functions. And I want to describe some methods that physicists have been using to try to uh, get a handle on these functions and simplify them. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, generalized polylogs and the notion of the, the symbol, which has been kind of useful. And then maybe we'll go on to one application, but we'll see how the time goes. Okay, so before we can generalize the polylogs, I should probably write down what the uh, ordinary or, or classical polylogs, the LIN functions are. So uh, first let's consider something that isn't a polylog, 1 over 1 minus x. So that has a Taylor expansion of uh, <coughs> x to the k. So if we take the integral 0 to x of dt over 1 minus t and plug in this, uh, well, on the one hand, we can just integrate it directly in terms of the logarithm. On the other hand, we can plug in this integral for this t to the k and then do the integral from 0 to x and uh, the index goes up by 1, and we get x to the k over k for an expansion around uh, x equals 0. But then we might want to integrate that again because the definition of the dialog rhythm is to integrate dt over t of, of this uh, minus the logarithm. And uh, so that's 
the definition of Li2 of x. So we just take this power series expansion, divide by, turn it into a formula for t, divide by t, integrate again. So you have an integral dt, t to the k minus 1 over k, and that's going to give you um, x to the k over k squared now. So that the um, series expansion of the di logarithm has a k squared in the denominator. And now we're going to define the integral dt over t, 0 to x of li n minus 1 of uh, t to be the classical polylog lin of x. And so that has the same formula, x to the k over k to the n. So we have some representations and integral representations of uh, the general classical polylog lin. And also there are interesting numbers associated with special values of this function. This is the uh, Riemann zeta value at n, sometimes written zeta sub n. So uh, these are all nice functions in the complex x-plane. They're regular around the origin. Here's their regu regular uh, Taylor expansion. And then starting at uh, 1, they, they develop a cut. But they kind of have lurking in here um, things that are uh, dt over t that look sort of like singularities around 0. Or to say it another way, it seems a little arbitrary that the first integral was dt over 1 minus t, and everything after that was dt over t. Maybe you should just do uh, a dt over t and dt over 1 minus t in different orders. So that was the uh, logic, and there was a need for such functions that led uh, Remedian and uh, Vermazarin to, to define a generalization of these called the harmonic polylogs. So they said, uh, let's uh, consider HW uh, of x, where this is a, a, a vector, and all the w to minus 1, 0, or 1. And if you have a 0 at the front and some other vector, then you integrate dt over t from 0 to x of the same uh, harmonic polylog without the zero in front. So this tells you how to, how to build up a sequence of uh, HPLs. This one tells you what you do if you have a zero in front, if you have a one in front. That corresponds to integrating dt over one minus t. And finally, if you have a minus one in front, Now actually, if you include this one, then the general branch structure gets more complicated and you can have branch cuts at, uh, branchings at, at minus one as well as at plus one. Uh, this is a, a one in the front and this is a minus one in the front. Okay. 
So this is just these zeros, ones, and minus ones are just code for what uh, what the last integration was. So if you only want things that have special behavior at zero and one, then you restrict your WIs to just be zero to zero and one. But for ap many applications, you also need minus one, and there are certainly cases that go beyond this too. And also you need to define a special case, which is that the ones with zeros, you can't really do the integral dt down to zero, so you, or it diverges down there, so you just define this thing to be one over n factorial times uh, log x to the n. So just like the classical polylogs have a, a ring of numbers associated with them called the Riemann zeta values, when you take the uh, HPLs with uh, W, WI just belonging to zero and one, those give you what are often called multiple zeta values. or uh, MZVs, and those can be defined as sums just like that. So in this case you have to have a nested sum Oops. Maybe I should have used a little different labeling, but okay. The summation variables are n1, n2, to nk, and they can be raised to different exponents. Um, but um, you need to take m1 greater than one to get it to converge. Just like here, you consider integers n greater than one for these uh, zeta values. And uh, these are very interesting objects uh, to, to number theorists. They obey a lot of different relations and, and have their own interesting structure, all of which is embedded inside the uh, structures of, of the harmonic polylogs. And there are then even further uh, generalizations that uh, have been defined. So the, these things are all functions of one variable. But you can generalize once again and write down um, what are sometimes called uh, Goncharov polylogs. So a Goncharov polylog has a definition that's very reminiscent of the harmonic polylog. It has an integral from zero to x dt over t minus a1. So it's almost the same formula as the harmonic polylogs, except that now these AI are not restricted to be minus one, zero, or one. They could be any complex numbers. So there's a lot more freedom in here. And in particular, if you have a multivariate, an amplitude that depends on multiple variables, you will often encounter these Goncharov polylog rhythms, where maybe one of your variables is X, but these other AIs may be functions of the other variables. So, uh, <coughs> yeah, yeah, coming back here. So, 
So uh, the, the uh, h with no indices is equal to 1. And you can start the recursion from there. So that the h1 is minus log of 1 minus x. h minus 1 is log of 1 plus x. And if you're adding zeros, you can't start with a zero because uh, or if, you have, if you're trying to start with n zeros, you've got to use this formula. Okay, so these are sort of a complete, I should have said, these are sort of a complete set of things that are branched in a certain way over these points. And, um, and so now we have this much more general space too. And uh, in all, all cases, all these kinds of functions have a huge uh, number of identities, which can be very complicated. Just as a simple example, suppose you have uh, g a b of x. Uh, sorry, let me start with g a of x times g b of x. So this is a, a double integral from, I'm just writing it uh, So this is an integral over a square that goes from 0 to x. But I could take the square and I could divide it into two pieces. And then in each piece I'd be integrating over a triangle. And I can convert that integral over the triangle into an iterated integral, which looks like a definition of, uh, of a g with two indices. And then when I flip over to the other side, I'm doing another triangular integral, but I've exchanged the role of A and B. And so I get another term like this. So this uh, over here, the fact that I get A, B, and B, A, this combination, it looks like a sum of uh, where sigma belongs to the uh, shuffle Remember that shuffle that we that we wrote down for color for in the kleist quaif relations where you have to take two sets and shuffle them together? And I haven't explained this to you, but this is the very first I example of a, what's called a shuffle identity when you multiply together two general Gontra polylogs, not just these very simple logarithms or weight one guys. You can uh, <coughs> rewrite things in terms of shuffles. So Equations like this give you a whole set of shuffle identities. That comes from the integral representations of these G functions like this. But as with the classical polylogs, there are also some sum representations. And you, when you multiply together nested sum representations, you can do similar things, breaking up the sums into, uh, you multiply two things together, the sums are unconstrained, you can break them up into sums that are greater than or less than, then you get nested sums. And, and these things give uh, things that are called the stuffle identities. So anyway, there's a huge number of identities that these kinds of polylogs obey. So uh, what physicists have been borrowed from the mathematicians is a uh, way of uh, defining a quantity associated with a function called the symbol, which is a kind of rational object and it's very easy to uh, determine when you have what the independent set of functions that you're dealing with is by calculating the symbols and seeing how many symbols there are.
So the symbol is a kind of uh, iterated deriv derivative. Why would that be useful? Well, just let's give a simple example. Suppose you want to uh, derive an identity like this. So th this is an identity that the dialogarithm obeys. But if you don't know anything about dialogarithms, well, you do know one thing about them because from the definition of the of the dialog rhythm you know that the derivative is um, minus log 1 minus x. In fact, this is sometimes called the li1 of x. So if you know all identities among logarithms, and here they are. There, that's all the identities you need to know among logarithms. Then, then you can uh, derive all identities among dialogarithms up to constants just by differentiating. Because the derivative of the dialog is a, oops, I forgot a factor here. The derivative is a, uh, minus log of 1 minus x over x. So you just take the derivative of this, and here you get minus log of 1 minus x over x. The derivative of pi squared over 6 is 0, so you lose information about that. And here we get minus log of 1 minus x over x from differentiating this, and then we get uh, plus log of x over 1 minus x. And when you differentiate this guy, sorry, screwed this up. I'm supposed to uh, probably take plus log. I needed to take that formula and replace x by 1 minus x and switch the sign for the argument. And then this one gives uh, plus uh, log 1 minus x over x. So if I did everything right, then the signs will work out. and. Uh, the identity will hold. So basically, <coughs> you get all dialog identities in principle by differentiating, and then um, you need to find some way to evaluate them at a particular point. For example, when you take x to 0, this vanishes, this vanishes, and you check that this is equal to pi squared over 6, or zeta of 2, to fix the constant. So the symbol is just uh, doing this many times and keeping track of what happens when you have a multivariable uh, function. So let's suppose we have one of these uh, functions, uh, f, which has weight. We, we are also going to... Um, which is some positive integer. And it could depend on many f variables. Let's call the variables xa. And now we're going to do the total differential, which contains all the information about taking partial derivatives with respect to any uh, any xa, and we're going to assume that, that this thing is a sum over a finite set of uh, variables, uh, of quantities that we call s. So we're also going to introduce some s's, which are functions of xa, and these are called the um, uh, letters in the symbol. and they belong to some set um, S. 
So then we sum over the, the derivative is going to be a sum of, of d log of si of xa. And then these, these things here are supposed to be weight uh, k minus 1. And then we're going to keep doing that. Uh, just to be clear, the derivative with respect to f of uh, xa is uh, the same sum times the partial log uh, si with respect to xa. So these are a lot, of, a number of different uh, rational prefactors, and you know there'll be things like if you differentiate this with respect to x, you get a one over x minus a, one of the a's. And those are examples of, of uh, the d logs, but there can be complicated dependencies of the si's on the x on the xas. In the case of the harmonic polylogs that we introduced before, the uh, letters in the symbol are um, just um, x one minus x. And also one plus x if we had the minus the minus one weight in there too. Okay, so then the symbol alphabet is very simple. In other words, when we differentiate the harmonic polylogs, we got because of the form of the integral, you get either one over x, one over one minus x, or one over one plus x. And those are d logs of of these three objects. So um, you can take, and the idea of the symbol is to just iterate this procedure all the way down until you get nothing left but d logs. So the second derivatives are um, So if we want to take now df of this function s, these functions si that showed up here, we can um, do the same sort of thing, but now we need to sum over sj. So that gives the differential of this function uh, si. But also the original function d, the total differential is a object that squares to zero. But on the other hand, there's a sum over sj and si. If we plug back into that formula, you get uh, something like f sj si d log sj wedge d log si. And so these equations here are called, uh, they're, they constrain these uh, quantities and they're called integrability relations because uh, they're really just the equality, imposing the equality of the mixed partial derivatives that you can reconstruct an actual function from, its, from specifying its derivatives like this. Yep. So this f can be, uh, the statement is that it, it lives in the same, there's a big space that is graded by the weight, which is the number of integrations or the, the in the Goncharov definition, how many of these uh, a's there are. And you're building up all these functions by iterated integration. So we're going to analyze the structure by differentiating the back again. So each differential strips off one integral and leaves you with something at one lower weight. 
F is a generic function in this space, and we're trying to characterize its properties. It's a k-fold integral of things that are rational, like those 1 over t minus ai's. Rational functions. Yeah. Yeah, that's basically it. So the uh, definition, the then when you go all the way down and iterate this all the way to, uh, well, I guess I said F was of, let, let me say, sorry, here I wrote a formula for F having weight uh, n, which I called k over there. So then the symbol of f is uh, written as a sum of uh, si1 to sin of uh, some, some quantity which has um, n of these indices on it. And then it has a d log of s. And these are usually written with tensors. Well, maybe I should, I'll write it like this. d log s1. But then people usually adopt a tensor where they drop the uh, logarithms so they don't have to write them all the time. So this is the symbol of, of a function of f of this type. So we should give a simple example. We'll go back to our dialog. And the definition of the dialog here says that dli2 of x is uh, minus log 1 minus x times d log of x. So we uh, see that, that the last entry of the symbol should be uh, log x. Well, we often omit the x. So so the symbol of uh, Li2 of x has an x here. Now you see what's sitting here is just a logarithm up to a minus sign. So we're instructed to put the argument of the logarithm here. So that's the symbol of Li2 of x. And uh, the symbol of Li2 1 minus x is um, just the same thing with um, the role of x and 1 minus x interchanged, for example. And I should say one other thing, which is that uh, suppose you have a product of two functions, f times g, and you take its derivative, so that's... Uh, gdf plus fdg. And you can expand that out as a sum over the symbol letters of gfsi plus fgsi uh, d log si. And then you can keep uh, sort of taking more derivatives in different directions. And you see you're going to get FSJ, SI, uh, G, then you're going to get some mixed terms. Um, 
if you think about it, as you keep doing this, sometimes you're going to have some letters on the F and some letters on the G, but the ones that are on the F are always in the correct order compared to what they are in the definition of the symbol of F. And the ones in G are always going to be in the right order. But they, those letters can be sort of interleaved. And so you won't be too surprised to learn that if you take a product of two functions, it's just the uh, um, symbol of F and then shuffled with the symbol of G. For example, the symbol of, uh, of log x log y is x tensor y plus another term with y tensor x. There's only two ways to shuffle x and y. Or if you had the symbol of log squared x log y, you would get, um, well, there's an overall two for the symbol of log squared x. And then when you multiply by y, you get x tensor x tensor y. Or you can put uh, x, put the y in the middle. Or you can put the y in the front. So finally, let's, I mean, let's just then look at the identity we had before. We take the symbol of Li2 of 1 minus x and check whether that's equal to the symbol of the right-hand side of that identity, pi squared over 6 minus log x log 1 minus x minus Li2 of x. So over here we saw that this was minus x tensor 1 minus x right here. The symbol of a constant evaluates to 0. And then here we're supposed to do the shuffle together or write in both orders. And then here we have to write uh, this guy with a plus. Okay, so now this cancels against this, and we get this again. So, no, it's a, it sort of tells you how many identities there are, but just like taking a derivative, it doesn't fix the zeta values in the identity. So the symbol is like a shadow of the function. It tells you a lot about the function, but it doesn't give it every single last detail. Okay, for that you have to do more work, but quite often it's useful when you're calculating an amplitude or some integral entering an amplitude to first work out the symbols or the sets of symbols and then, and then later reconstruct what all the zeta values are or give it an exact representation in terms of Goncharov polylogs. So you can do that by matching the symbol first and it turns out that the later steps are often not as hard, at least computationally. Yep, question? The basically the a ones to a ends are are the letters, and and the idea is that you will have the given physical problems with given kinematics can then be identified, I mean the hard part is sort of making this connection, with some alphabet or some set of letters. And then even when you go to sort of very high weights in principle, the number of letters is restricted. So the sets of A's, is, you know, you don't use an arbitrary new variable for each weight. So the, uh, I'm not going to go into this application because there's no time. But just to state that the one I was going to talk about was an example. And the, the uh, problem is to do multi-loop amplitudes 
in planar n equals 4. And to keep the uh, space of functions under control, we, we just do the six gluon amplitudes. But we believe that for any loop order, there's, there is a set of elements of the symbol. So these things are, are functions of just three variables. So these would be like the XAs. There are only three variables needed to describe these scattering amplitudes. And the symbol alphabet contains U, V, and W, and one minus U, one minus V, and one minus W. If, if we had stopped there, it would have been the tensor product uh, space of, of uh, harmonic polylogs in U, harmonic polylogs in V, and harmonic polylogs in uh, W. But there are three more letters, Y, U, Y, V, and Y, W. And these are also functions of U, V, and W, but there's some complicated, um, they have square root dependence on um, on U, V, and W, which is what makes it so either complicated or fun, depending on your point of view. And uh, <coughs> so you can actually, um, there, there are other restrictions on this space. For example, from the where the branch cuts are located, we can deduce that the first entry in the symbol does not belong to this full space, but it can only be U, V, and W. And from compatibility of multiple branch cuts, we can also say something about the first two entries of the symbol. And then what we can do is we can just ask how many different polylogarithmic functions have live in that restricted space, and we can build it up iteratively. And then we can actually impose physical constraints on the amplitude. And we never have to do the sorts of thing I was describing in the first part of the lecture. In the first part of the lecture, I was talking about taking specific cuts, building up a loop integrand, and then integrating it. In the one loop case, it's trivial to do. In the two loop case, it rapidly becomes an enormous mess. And so in this case, we're able to bypass that step of integrating the loop amplitudes just by um, making an educated guess about what all possible loop integrals could possibly be, and then writing the answer down in that form. And we're actually able to go so far to six loops doing this. I mean, this is not the real world. This is planar n equals four super Yang mills, but it's a, it's a good uh, training ground for uh, some of the things you'd like to do back in the real world. And uh, anyway, I think I've come to the end of my time here. So uh, hope you got a little bit out of this. And uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks.